Hello and welcome to the Rob Rugby League podcast. I'm Mike Mayhood and we are finally catching up with the present day. In fact, by the time you hear this, it could already be the past, who knows, because we are going to talk about South Sydney. We are talking about this after their defeat to the New Zealand Warriors, which has lost coach Jason Dimitri in the stickiest of situations. You could be sacked by the time you hear this, but it won't actually matter because we are talking about where they've come from, where they are going, what is going wrong, because this is a team that was less than a year ago, top of the NRL and looking a million bucks or eight point something million dollars, if you will, whatever their salary caps were. Obviously, I write a lot about South Sydney because it's my job, but I'm not a fan. So I thought I'd get two books on who are fans and who also contribute real good stuff on rugby league. So first up, we have Matt Bungard, host of the NRL Boom Rookies, ESPN columnist, and I'm described you as long-suffering South fan. <laughs> Hello, Matt. Uh, Hello, mates. Yeah, you mentioned going back to the past. I would love to go back to the past, specifically, you know, 2014, maybe somewhere around that time. But uh, yeah, no. Um, so uh, I guess recently suffering, the last decade or so has been pretty good for the most part, up until the last, you know, back half of last season and the first four weeks of this one. Yeah, well, you know, we could go back to 2004, in which case it'd be quite bad. So. Well, I, hey, 2004 would be get better than, you know, 2000, 2001, when there was no South Sydney in the NRL at all. But uh, yeah, I'll take a bad team over no team whatsoever. Well, I'm not going to leave the uh, kick him out the comp chat for later on. <laughs> we, our other guest is writer at Rugby League Writers and analyst of tactics and things like that is Oscar Panifax. Welcome aboard. Thank you, mate. Yeah, happy to be here. You're talking about going back to the past. Yeah, it reminds me of being a young fella praying for a Nathan Merritt miracle intercepts just to to clinch a random two points on a on a Saturday night. Uh, yeah, it's feeling a little bit like that at the moment, but um, I guess that's what we're here to discuss today. Yeah, well, as a as the NRL media's resident Hall FC supporter, me and Craig Fitzgibbon keeping it going, are we? Uh, it's nice to see people have a team who are worse than ours, at least relative to the competition, because we've at least we won one game. I think South have won one. So there you go. And we have Jay Nockenborough and you don't. Uh, right. Let's go for the, what I've just described as the first question is a pit of despair check. So is this, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like, is this terminal? Does this feel like it's going to get any better, Matt? Uh, no, not really. I think that there was, I mean, we'll never know exactly what the catalyst was for their sharp decline in the middle of last year when, of course, if you remember, Mike, going back to Magic Rounds and then the week after that when they played the West Tigers and beat them, I think, 20 nil. South led the South led the competition and looked fantastic. They'd just come off a run where they'd beaten Penrith. They'd, they'd really handily beaten Melbourne. They thrashed the Broncos a couple of weeks before that. They weren't just winning. They were winning emphatically. They were winning on the back of some really enterprising attacking play and also some really good defense. And then seemingly for no reason at all, it just completely flipped on a dime and they became the worst team in the competition since round 12 last year. I'm pretty sure that's right. They've only won five yeah. games. You'd be hard-pressed to find a team that would be worse. Maybe the Tigers. I'm not 100% sure. But I came into this season with an open mind. I came into this season thinking, look, hopefully they've just been talking about la what happened last year a lot. They've been going through the tape and they've been taking every step they possibly can to ensure that this doesn't happen again. And then the second half of the Manly game happened. And I went, ah, it doesn't appear like anything's changed. And then that was compounded by a pretty abject performance against the Broncos. And then the culmination was the round three embarrassment against the Roosters. And I don't think any South fan, I can't speak for Oscar, but I don't think any South fan thought that that win over the Bulldog was some giant sort of step in the right direction. And then it was straight back down to earth with a thud last week against the Warriors. And I don't really know how they're getting out of this hole. The forward pack looks old all of a sudden. Guys that were guys that have been leaders in that team for, for years just suddenly look like they're not up to scratch anymore. Cody Walker, a traditionally a slow starter, well, that slow start is now stretched into the sixth week of the season. He he just hasn't looked like his best. The halfback situation, well, I'm sure we'll get into it later. And and the big man at the back just hasn't looked motivated either. So it just feels like at the moment, especially with, you know, Campbell Graham and Alex Johnson injured as well, like basically you look at that old guard of South players and with the exception of Cameron Murray and at times Damian Cook, it doesn't really, you're not really getting much at all out of any of those guys that most of whom played in the grand final just over two years ago. Well, you know, I like that uh, it was like a little applause there. It was my dog went, yes, mm. I really agree with that point. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so Oscar, maybe you can fill us in here because I know you 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 love a a video, and whilst we don't have any video, we're just going to talk about it. But yep. maybe it's worth going back to the start of what what made South good in the first place because I can place this. You mentioned there, Matt, the the victory over Penrith, right? And I can remember sitting in the press conference. If, if people can recall, the try that they scored was the move that South always tried. And it came off perfectly with the game on the line. Mm. And I said something to Jason Dimitri in the press conference along the lines of, like, this must be very satisfying because you've practiced that move. And if you could, the time you can go down to Redford and now have from Park and watch their training and you would see them practice it, little catch, catch passes. Yep. And I was like, that must be very satisfying. And he basically went, you know, we've been doing that since November of 2020 or whatever. And yeah. So maybe I could go into what, what South's fundamental you were trying to do. And then we can sort of afterwards go into why it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, look, I think you nailed it there. Um, I think under JD, it's it's a very formulaic or, or systematic kind of approach to attack. Like we'll get into some numbers later, but looking at offloads, looking at tackle busts, all those kinds of, you know, more dynamic or eyes up footy uh, is a term that's overused a little bit in rugby league circles these days. But Souths don't really play that style of footy. Um, they've got a halfback in, it was Ilias and now Hawkins, but two similar profile players um, who know how to get to certain spots on the field, who know how to engage specific defenders in the line. Um, and to me, I think the greatest evidence of this is um, how effective Souths have been on set starts over the last few years. Um, we know how to get to points on the field and then the whole game plan basically is get the right play the ball on the right post and then double down on that uh, Cam Murray, Cody Walker, Latrell Mitchell movement on the left. And, yeah, that Penrith game is a good example. Um, Cody puts Tass down the touchline for the match winner in that, but Souths ran that shape four or five times in that last 10 minutes and almost broke him every time. I think that, in a nutshell, is what Souths um, under JD look like in a best-case scenario. Um, but all of that last year was happening on the back of one of the best defensive systems in the comp. We were conceding 13 and a half points per game on average over the first 12 weeks of the competition. And in a side um, with as much attack as we had last year, if you're keeping in your opposition to under 13 points, like we were in position to win games. Uh, and to me, that feels like what the game plan was. All these numbers, like I mentioned, low offloads before, we take a lot of one out carries and yardage. We'll do a shift to key on, maybe find an offload there on play three or four, and then it's get to the kick, grind, and just put Cody and Latrell into positions on the field to have positive involvements. And we just haven't been doing that this year. Yeah, you've you've touched them. So my issue with South, right? This is my theory anyway, overarching theory, is that this style basically hasn't evolved. Like yep. JD was running the tactics prior to being the head coach when Bennett was there. Bennett was sort of, you know, hovering above like he does. Mm -hmm. Skeletor kind of, you know, having little conversations on the back of the bus whilst JD was the one doing the X's and O's. And that part of me just thinks like every other team has seen this now so many times that it just doesn't work anymore. Do you think this is, is this, is it as simple as that they've become quite predictable with the ball? Because if you think the start of last year, they, when you had Keon on the right with Campbell Graham yep. and Ilias predominantly you could, they did have another thing that they could do that wasn't just the one thing that they were good at, which kind of took them to the grand final in 2021. Um, Matt, do you think that's something that's, you know, would that be a correct analysis to say that it's just a little bit same, same now? I think that you, you touched on it there briefly as well. I think at the start of the season when it was announced that Keon would be moving to the left-hand side of the field and people thought, oh, that's good. They're strengthening a strength, all that stuff. But in reality, that made what they do in attack sort of even more one-dimensional than it is. We know how good South's left side is. It's been the most productive side of any team in the competition over the last few years. It's why Alex Johnson has so many tries. It's why Cody Walker has so many try assists. But a large part of that was because if it wasn't working or if teams were overloading that side to try and stop those left side spreads, you had an edge with guys who are as dynamic as Keon Kalamatangi and Campbell Graham on it. And Campbell Graham's injured and they moved Keon Kalamatangi to the other side of the field. And so when the right-hand edge is... Richie Kenner, uh, Richie Kenner, Jacob Gagai, and Jacob Host, or who, which, whichever combination of guys it has been at various points. They try Jair out there as well. When when there's when there's no one that's really striking fear in the hearts of the opponents on the other side of the field, then 
there's no reason for teams to respect them. And when that happens, you're left in a situation, which I think they are in now, where teams know what South like to do in attack. And they're not really worried about if they deviate from that because they don't really respect or fear the guys on the other side of the field. So would it be different if Campbell Graham and Jai Arrow were fit? Maybe. But yeah, at the moment they aren't. And if they're not, then and you know that they're not because they're not playing, then you have to do something different. And they just they just haven't been. There's a the line that um, Richard Hadley, when he played for New Zealand, he, he um, the great all-rounder of the 1970s and 80s, where Graham Gooch, the England captain, said it was like facing the world 11 at one end and Ilford seconds at the other. And that's kind of <laughs> the metaphor that works for South's two sides of the field, which was, you know, this is this is Trent Barris Bulldogs. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when they've got Matt Burton and Ado Carr on one side, you know which side they're going to pass it, when the other ones was what? Braden Burns and Jaden Oppenburg. Um Oscar, you look like you were primed to make some sort of uh, addition to that. Yeah, I, I agree with both both um, points that Matt makes there to a degree. Like combinations and cohesion uh, is such still an underrated aspect uh, in rugby league. South's entire right edge from the off season is not on the field at the moment. Lockie Elias, yep. Jai Arrow, Campbell Graham, and one of either Tyrone Munro, or Isaac Thompson, or Tarnow, whoever it was going to be, right? So there's... 12, 16 weeks of practice completely thrown out the window on that right edge. Uh, and then on the other edge, I think there's a few things to consider there. Like, yeah, it's predictable, but it's been predictable for the last decade and teams still really haven't been able to handle it when Souths execute well. Um, I think a recent example right now is that shape that the Warriors are running with Adam Fanua Blake um, out on that right edge there. Teams see that coming and they still can't defend it because they execute so well, right? And the things that they're doing right um, on that AFB shape is Wade Egan's, well, the forwards are folding the line in towards the ball because they're winning the uh, they're winning the ruck and they're getting quick play of the balls. Egan's jumping out and he's got a little bit of craft. So the def- A's and B's are turning into him. And then it's Torhu or it's Sean Johnson, who are two of the better ball players in the comp, picking the right options. When Murray and Cody and Latrella are on, they do the same thing on our left edge, but we haven't been winning the ruck. Damian Cook's craft has never been a strength of his game. So when we are playing off the back foot, Cookie doesn't have the ability to hold up markers and turn in an A, a B, and a C defender just to get Cody or, or Cam a little bit further over the ad line. So there's all these little things, I think, that contribute to the fact that we haven't seen that smooth left edge uh, or that familiar left edge. Um, and then the, my biggest bugbear was... We saw a lot of do, a lot of new shapes through Keon on the left edge over the first two weeks. They didn't come off. Uh, we had Richie Kenner, a new face there, where Jack Whiten would have trained all summer as well. There was evidence, at least to me, that Souths had spent a lot of time introducing a few different shapes and different looks to that edge to use the different skill sets of Keon and, and Jack Whiten. And now we're into round five and Keon's back over onto the other edge and we just kind of seem to throw it all away. So... That, to me, is a concerning sign. Yes. One of the things I would have said about Dimitri is sort of ideological ideological consistency was a strength of his. Like, he was pretty, you know, this is what I think is going to happen and we're going to stick to it. And he does seem to, you know, usually the death spiral of of coaches across all sports is when they, the thing that they, you know, the antipostocogly, we never stop kind of thing, when they start changing that, that's when you know that they've kind of lost faith in what they're doing. Yeah. I just wanted to pick out something you mentioned there about winning the rooks as well, because Matt, you mentioned before the the pack looks very old overnight, and you can see you know Tom Burgess is going, and then you look at the guys who come in beneath, mm. in you know Debbie Moale, who's kind of doesn't look like he's got much better in all of his time playing in the NRL. Someone like Shaq Mitchell, I think. How many other teams with pretensions to win a premiership would play Shaq Mitchell? Not that many, I would imagine. Is that? Is that something that's kind of been mismanaged by the roster in terms of trying to keep guys like the trail cook walker there's got to be savings happen elsewhere and that seems to be where it's been made and we're kind of seeing that as a problem now yeah i think a lot of it just comes down to they they, south's quite just quietly haven't really done an amazing job in the last couple of years of introducing a sort of a lot of younger new talents to that team. It's been very much the same sort of squad for a few years now. Someone sent me a list of every player that's debuted for Souths. Uh, so they made their NRL debut 
whilst playing for Souths since Keon Coloma Tungy's debut in 2020. And it's Jackson Bolo, Jack John, Stephen Masters, Footy Dean, um, Blake Taft, Davey Miley, Lachlan Ilias, Isaiah Tash, Shaq Mitchell, Trent Peoples, Isaac Thompson, um, Cole Lovett, uh, Talis Duncan, and Tyron Ty- 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 Munro. That's it. That's the full list. And yeah. Oh, and Pete Mamazula, sorry, as well, and um, and that's it. And th- and there's not really, with the exception of Talis Duncan, a guy on there that you would be. There's a, there's not many forwards there at all, and B, there's not really guys there that you think, oh yeah, this this th- this is guy is going to be the guy that's going to take over from Tom Burgess or the guy that's going to take over from Junior Tatola or anything like that. And whilst Talis Duncan has shown flashes of that, yeah, it, it's just been a concern that like it's just it's kind of been like a quiet culmination over a couple of years. Like they lost some guys that I thought were really effective contributors for them. Guys like Jaden Sewer and Harme Sele. I'm Sele, who, yeah. we just, who were just bit part players, but they were yeah. they were important roles. And those guys have gone and we haven't really replaced them. And I think that's come to a head this year when those guys, those guys, those those top guys, like Junior Toller, who was, you know, a couple of years ago on the verge of New South Wales selection, and Tom Burgess, who's been a great player for a really long time, have maybe slow down a little bit this year and there's just not really anyone again with the exception of Cameron Murray behind them to really sort of take over the t- and, and lead from the front. Yeah. I'll double down on that too. I think I had to use the Waz as an example again, but they're a team with a relatively new coach and you can name pretty much every player one through 17 in that Warriors roster has improved underneath Andrew Webster since he arrived. And I think for me, guys, like I'm a big Isaiah Tass fan in terms of what he's done since coming up from the Q Cup, but has he really improved as an individual or has he just kind of gradually progressed as he's found his feet in first grade? Keon, same thing. He's, you know, he's verging on elite tier back rower, but is that just because he's so naturally gifted or is that because he's been coached? Like, really, we haven't seen Keon evolve his game much uh, from when he first came into the NRL. Um and then, yeah, guys like Burgess, I think obviously his lateral movement um, is more and more apparent this year than it's ever been. Is that because we've thrown him into a starting role because we're struggling in yardage and therefore he's getting exposed more because he's playing longer minutes? Kepi, the exact same thing. I mean, these these issues through our middle uh, were apparent in the trials and over the first five weeks, like Reese Walsh's try um, against us at Suncorp, looked very similar oh, to the try that's creaky, Marty Martin. Creaky is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. And, you know, Tedesco scored a try back in against the Rock. Sam Walker, that lucky kick that he found Manu with uh, in round three, like, sure, you're not going to score a try off a, off a deflected kick every week, but the principles were the same. Mm. Teams have identified that we're lazy and we're not filling up spaces around the Rock and they're turning the ball back, back in underneath and we're conceding tries every week through a really skinny middle. So you've, you've come up with one of my uh, sort of interesting ideological points about Jason Dimitri's football there that you, so you mentioned before the, the hit up percentage, which is really, really high, 90th percentile for the most sort of one out hit ups. Yep. South have never under Dimitri ever tried to make meters out of the backfield, right? It's not, you know, you look at, if you look at the breakdown, I've done the numbers on this, I haven't got them to hand, but I've done them in the past about who, what percentage of a team's meters are made by their back five? And South yes. and Parramatta are the two teams that really don't bother. They're like, we're just going to double down big guys, props in the middle. Yep. Wingers, wingers for scoring tries, they're not for starting sets. Yep. And you look at, you know, I don't want to call up Captain Four much and too early, but Alex Johnson's never been a strength. Latrell, not a strength. Isaac Thompson is kind of the only one who who is a bit like that, but he's, you know, would he be playing first grade if other people weren't injured? Tyrone Monroe, who might be playing if he wasn't injured, he's not like that. And then that makes you real vulnerable when the pack isn't on, which, you know, we've seen Parramatta have it where they couldn't maintain it across 80 minutes because you have to re- rotate your forwards. Souths have found it now that if your forwards suddenly don't look as good, then there's nobody else who can do that that fundamental work. Is that? And that doesn't seem to me like something you can change overnight. Like sacking the coach isn't going to make you have suddenly have a load of, you know, yardage making backs in a way that another coach might might want. Yeah, well, I'll play devil's advocate here. I dare say that's probably what Jason Demetrio has been saying to the South's board at the moment, which is that our entire back, uh, game plan this year would have been built around Campbell Graham and Jack White and taking play two or three carries in exit sets. 
those two are arguably two of the best one out ball carriers um, coming out of yardage in the competition, right? So we can carry, like you said, an AJ or a Tyrone. Latrell can be fairly passive in yardage because the idea was Campbell and Jack were going to be giving us 150, 200 meters a week. So, you know, I imagine Jason's probably sitting in there saying, hey, well, we've lost our entire yardage plan. Are all these other things happening because we're under so much more fatigue because other guys are having to step in and do that work that we weren't planning on them doing this season? I'm not saying it's an excuse, but it is an insight, I think, into maybe how Jason wanted this team to play this year. And because of those injuries, um, you know, we haven't been able to. There's injuries everywhere, though. So, like I said, it's not an excuse in the NRL. Might he, in that meeting as well, be discussing, and I put this tweet out, and I have to find it here, that the completion rate is hit 73%, which is, so completion rates for those, you know, it is a load of nonsense, basically, but you can't win many games of football beneath 73%. You can win the NRL at about 74 and the Roosters have done it twice, and Saints have won Super League on something similar. Yep. But the Souths have hit that twice in five games this year and eight times in the previous 18 games. That's and, if it's seven, and that's the absolute floor of what you can hit. And I think they've actually won two games. They've won one on 62%, which was against the Dragons in uh cans and was one of the worst games of football you will ever see is that ben combining the St. Jo- yes ben hunts 300 it was uh combining the joys of the st george of the world dragons with the south so let's drop the ball every two <laughs> players um is this something Matt? if you're if you're you know if you're weighing up the odds as Blake, sorry are you looking at this and going well jd has got a point here he, he, he can't catch the football for these blokes or is it something more that's in the like the way that they play is quite high risk and that kind of even when they were good it wasn't the best part mm. of the game you know no it wasn't but i think this year especially most of those errors haven't been through like enterprising rugby league there's just been like very very basic stuff so i think back to a few errors in the first half of the game on the weekend right you had south played i thought played the best 10 minutes they played all year in the first no not 10 probably five or six best five or six <laughs> minutes they played all year, and they were they were winning that forward battle every set they had up to and including the try. They were they were they, on fifth tackle. They were past halfway. They were yep. winning that yardage battle with the Warriors. And then what happens? They score a try. Jijital drops the ball one play after the kickoff. The yep. Warriors score immediately, and it's like oh shit, here we go again. And they just wilted immediately. And then later on in that half, there was two or three times. So it, I think once or twice in the first half, and then again in the second half, where Isaac Thompson was just in the wrong spot for a Jack White and pass, and Jack White threw the ball forward. And it's just really basic stuff like that. And you might say, oh, well, the spread is risky. But it's not risky if Isaac Thompson is standing a little bit deeper where he's meant to be standing and Jack White throws the ball to the right person. So to the right spot. And just so much of so many of the mistakes that they make are just so simple. And they're not coming because of any sort of swashbuckling rugby league. They're coming just because I have no I, they just can't complete their sets. And it's just been a big, big problem last year. And it's been a gigantic problem this year. I think, like, I, again, I don't know how I don't know if, how you would get these numbers, but I feel like they would be close to the competition leaders in making an error immediately after scoring points. I feel like they are one of the worst offenders for this. Like, you think, but not just on the weekend, but you think back to that Broncos game where they did really well to get back to twelve all in that game, and then what happened? They they dropped it off the kickoff, and Brisbane went up sixteen twelve straight afterwards. And then at that point, they put the cue in the rack, and the game was over. And I feel like that seems to happen every other week, and it's immensely frustrating. And yes, that's not Jason Demetrius's fault, but it, it does seem to be a mental thing more than anything else at this point, or an application thing, because the errors are coming from simple situations, not complex ones. Yeah, the complex ones is an interesting stat I pulled out. This is a um, something that I have created myself to make a point about South Sydney, but they have the most... So if you can run how many line breaks a team has and how many line break assists a team has collectively... South have got the highest percentage of their line breaks come from assists, as in to say somebody putting somebody else through a hole. So yeah. They don't have the, you know, you think of Latrell carrying five guys over the line. That doesn't actually happen very often compared to how often Joey Marnie who holds off a defender and offloads it, for example. Yeah. Like Souths have got really, they're really good at running attacking shapes. And I think the next, off the top of my head, the next best was is Manly and Quinola, who played a very similar yep. style where this is what they're trying to do. Yep. And I just think that, that, if you're going to have that, you'll be very good at attacking, but you will make mistakes. And it's kind of it is what you say, Matt, it's where you make those mistakes because nobody complains about a completion rate of 73% if all of the errors were made on the fourth tackle trying to put someone through a hole. 
whereas everybody complains about a completion rate of 80% if all the errors are made on first Apple 20 yards from your own line, which is kind of why completion rates are nonsense. But is this something that is can it change? Like basically, because it looks to me like once the confidence aspect goes, and I asked JD about this in a press conference recently and said, I think it was after the Roosters game and said, look, you, you know, Cody Walker made five errors, but he also created the only two tries. How do you talk to a player like that and say, you need to keep doing this because if you don't do it, the whole plan falls over. And that to me seems like the problem that Salas have now is that they make so many errors that they won't try the thing that actually was successful because it involves errors. This isn't aimed at anybody. I'm just sort of running. Yeah. Ask them. <laughs> <laughs> but is that is, so? JD did. I say he didn't really give a very satisfactory answer, and he usually is very good on these things. Whereas I can remember asking the same question of Trent Robinson he, when that when the Roosters were rubbish, and he did give a very satisfactory answer, and they kind of got better. And that seems to me maybe that's that's an issue that if I was Cody Walker or Latrell Mitchell or someone like that, that's where I'd be going. Maybe this guy doesn't quite quite have it. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't want to comment on, you know, uh, where Cody's at in terms of in terms of his career. Obviously, he's getting older as well, but some of his past selection, you know, we've associated him with being one of the most silky natural ball players in the competition um, over the last few years. And yeah, just maybe is he second guessing a little bit, like some little double pumps and um, you know, passes going a little bit behind. I don't know. I think it's also, I mentioned combinations and cohesion again, like those two, uh, Jack White and errors where he passed to Isaac Thompson. Yeah. Isaac was out of position, but how many reps have Jack and Isaac done together over the last three months, you know, almost none. Um, and then you throw in the fact that Isaac Thompson looked like a guy who probably needed another few weeks in reserve grade from a fitness perspective, He's someone who's struggled with his health and his fitness since making his debut. Um, you know, I understand the injuries force hands, but yeah, it's those little issues are being, you know, magnified right now because of the shit show that's going on in Redfern at the moment. In isolation, they're not big issues, but yeah, I think when you're throwing them all together on the back of, yeah, poor completions and no yardage game and a poor fifth tackle kick options, then it all just kind of starts to add up. Now you've 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 mentioned that I've I've done all the stats here and all I've got on kicking is kicking is an afterthought. Yep. Because mm. this is there were there were stats that I pulled in there, so I haven't put them down because I thought they'd be way too boring. But basically, Souths, I'm not really interested and have never really been interested in kicking, which made it so strange to me that they decided that the person who would be the, you know, Matt will tell you my love of Lachlan Elias is un, is undying, but he. He really didn't seem to be the problem here, <laughs> like because he seemed to be doing exactly what his role in the system was all along, and that to me, yeah, I'm, I'm, I wonder what you think, man, that in terms of where the the halfback comes in, mm -hmm. because the main thing that you might want out of your halfbacking system, i.e., kicking, has never really been, even when Souths were good, it wasn't a huge priority. Yeah, it's not since Adam Reynolds left has it has has they really been uh, anything that they're remotely interested in. You're right, and. I wrote about this when the pressure really did get to the Ilias situation after those first two weeks of the season. I didn't think that bringing in Dean Hawkins was going to be a magic wand that was going to fix everything. But I did think that if they needed to make a change, it was really the only significant one they could make. Ilias was very poor in the first two rounds of the season. There was multiple instances in both of the first two games where he just dropped the ball cold 10 metres out from the opponent's line. Like, and that you know that's not good enough. And, and and when his job in the team is basically to make his tackles and give the ball to Cody and Latrell, you can't be doing things like that. Did I expect Dean Hawkins to be a marked improvement on him? No, but at the same time, I've been really disappointed in what I've seen from Hawkins so far. Like this was a guy that all the talk was about this this sort of magical kicking game and 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 how he was the guy that Adam Reynolds had been grooming to be his successor before he left and all the stuff. And we just haven't seen any of that in the first three weeks of his of his first grade career. We haven't really seen a single time where I've, I've seen him put up a kick that's been sort of testing in any real way. Like I think back to that Bulldogs game and basically just, I think he just hooked like 10 kicks back to like the South's right-hand side, the Bulldogs left-hand side, just like nothing kicks straight to Blake Tile, like over and over and over again. And I know a lot of this is because of the forward pack, not laying them a platform to, to perform, but I do feel like had that horrific injury not happened this week, I think we might've seen Lachlan Elias back in first grade this week because he was playing quite well in reserve grade and they tried the footy Dean thing and it didn't really work. 
But now I think that there's a big chance that when the teams come out in a few hours, and maybe this will be redundant by the time people listen to this, but I do think there's a, a big chance that we see a White and walker Harbs combination this week. Yeah, that's kind of the obvious lever that can be pulled, right? And it would seem to me like you're going away from the system because so if you if you look at if you were to rank South's salary cap, and I know I I liked your piece on this, uh, Matt, to the point where mine was also worryingly similar, which I'd already written, and I was like, shit, can I publish this because it looks like something that somebody else is? Um, but my argument in it was that if you look at where the salary cap is, is distributed at Souths, most teams would have the halfback towards the top of their key players when Souths have him to the bottom. And I thought, well, actually, yeah. in terms of where they play, the way that they play, that is kind of true because your halfback is organizer, distributor, and nothing else, like get the ball to, you know, if you if you look, for example, I think the example I used is at Penrith, that who, who the most important brains in the team are, Nathan Cleary, Isaiah, Yo, you know, and then you could debate Luai or, or Edwards, whereas at South, it's very much Latrell, Cody, Wood, uh, Wood, that's me, Cook, <laughs> Wood, Latrell, Cody, Cook, Murray, then Ilias. So mm. it did make sense that you're, you could carry a player like that. And I, I, I wonder again, if I was JD, would I be going, well, this is how we planned it. And maybe we mm. should talk to Latrell and Cody about this because they're the ones being paid the big bucks and not doing it because in my in my opinion Cameron Murray must be looking around training going well I'm doing it what 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 what, the, what about the rest of you boys yeah I I mean the white and into the halves chat is not going to go away unless South suddenly win five games in a row uh, <laughs> with someone else in there I can't think of a worse option for Souths right now we played Richie Kenner at left center for the first two weeks and he had about th- four or five try uh, contributions uh, from the <laughs> negative side of things. Um, just respectfully, his lateral movement isn't up up for it. If we take Whiten out of our back five, where are we getting our yardage from? We've got mm. an 80 kilogram Jai Gray who's likely to play fullback this week. Like, I just, I can't understand how that would improve what is currently one of the worst yardage, you know, exit sets in the competition. Um, and then you also think back to, I mean, when Whiten played six at, at the Raiders, like he got moved from six because it wasn't working. Um, I, I understand why people are suggesting it because of the quality of player that Jack is. I think they're in, in this team, though. Um, I don't think that's the answer. I'd entertain moving Luttrell into the six if we had a genuine one option um, to replace him just to get his hands on the ball, ball uh, more in that second and third layer of a shift. But you move Cody into first into halfback he needs to play first receiver Cody's strengths are out on the tram lines throwing the tries he's passed so you're moving him out of his strongest area um yeah. you'd also be putting a lot more ball playing pressure on Cam Murray who right now is one of our only effective go forward guys so you're taking away some of his uh running because you need him to pass we don't have a ball playing dummy half um so you know maybe a running six and seven works if you've got a guy like Mamazelos who can create and ball play a little bit through the middle. But, um, yeah, I, I, I can't see how White and Souls the answers uh, in the halves. And, yeah, I feel for Lockie. I'm a big Lockie Ilias fan. I'll be the first to admit his kicking uh, game is an issue in terms of positionally where he gets to before he's actually putting boot to ball is often the reason for a lot of his kick errors. Um, but right now, the Rabbitohs' biggest issues are all effort areas. Kick chase, yeah. non-existent. Kick pressure, non-existent. Line speed, non-existent. The line, the line speed is pathetic. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, These... well, can I but... can I direct this with with uh, some? There's a real good stat I've got on this. Yeah. So um, I there's graphs. What I'm saying is watch this space. There's graphs. But <laughs> I've made my own statistics on this. I've gone back and data I need it. Like I need a Kramerica Industries intern to do this for me. <laughs> Um, do you like stats contribute to the raw? And I will uh, give you things to do. But Silas's line speed, there's a brilliant stat, which is pre-contact meters, which is basically if you take meters and you take post-contact meters and you subtract post-contact from, mm. from regular meters, you can work out what the line speed is, basically, which yeah. is up in, in isolation is completely useless, but you can obviously then compare it over time. You can compare it to other teams. And even when Souths were good, 
they basically always lost the line speed battle. Every other team's line speed. And this isn't, it's very difficult to work this out across all 17 teams. I really don't have time to do this, but you can work it out just against the teams that South's played and they lose it almost every week. And I've even gone as far as put, doing three game rolling averages, five game rolling averages to try and remove any you know, peaks and troughs out of it. And basically they have never won line speed. It's not something that they're particularly bothered about, which does stand to reason with, if you want your props to take all the hit ups, then you, the, the downside of that is that they can't defend in a way that the Panthers props almost never take any hit ups, which yeah, means that they example. can defend. Yeah. Um, so is this something, is this a symptom or is this a cause? That's kind of, I guess, the question because the line speed being dreadful is something that it, it, when everything else goes wrong, it looks really bad because it looks like they're not trying. But I feel like when, when it was going really well, it was also a problem. Is that, is this something that we're now noticing more because the rest of it's rubbish or is it a fundamental reason why it's rubbish? Yeah, I think it's probably being compounded because Souths are playing under so much fatigue. Um, but the fact that you've you've found consistent numbers throughout the last you know three years when when we weren't terrible, um, may, maybe it's a symptom more so than a um, uh, sorry a cause more so than a symptom. But um, yeah, I, to me it's just an indication of effort areas. Like I said, mm. all, all, all of those things off the ball and then on the ball as well. Um, I mean, the most recent example is Isaac Thompson's try last week where he managed to step Chance, Nickel Cook, start and score. If he doesn't step Chance there, there was not a single South Sydney jersey in the frame supporting back on the inside. And that happened multiple times whenever Jack made a little half break down that left edge too. So for me, that's a sign of a team that's just not working hard for each other, you know, preemptively. They're reacting all the time. And that's why I felt so sorry for Lockie Elias because – for all of you know the things that he needed to improve on, the one thing that he oozed every week was effort. Yeah. Um, and it was frustrating to see him dropped while the rest of the team kind of still lingered uh, in those effort areas, I thought. There was a stark contrast as well in that game where the Warriors scored multiple times off Wade Egan yep. darting out and there being multiple options for him to give the ball to. And there was a moment early in the second half where Damian Cook made yes. a similar run and turned around to look for someone to pass the ball to, and there was nobody there. Yep. No one at all. And then he had to throw it wide out to Whiten, and then Whiten kind of made a half break from nothing, and then he had no one to pass to either. And say what you will about Jack Whiten, but he he tries. He has a crack. So, like, yeah, it's just just really disappointing. I don't really – it's quite funny that we can have all the graphs in the world and all the stats in the world, and these are all great, Mike, but I think both Oscar and I are in agreement, but – that they're just not they're just not putting in they're just not working hard enough it well might, so it might just be that simple so so there is a coaching element to this right so i my favorite thing after completion my stuff is push supports because yeah. all the good coaches talk about push supports all the time and i in recent weeks have spoke to benji marshall about this for example in which i was trying to frame this in the politest way possible but i was the the, the question was you know how happy Corusa runs to the line and last year he turned around and there was nobody there. How much of your coaching has been, hey, Alex Safar, you might not be that good, but if you just run forwards, let the good guy will pass the ball to you and you might find stuff happens. And there was a bit of that going on where I thought, like, I know I spoke to Lee Brears last year who was basically saying this about Wigan, then saying about the Broncos, like, just get around the footy and stuff happens. Yeah. Guys like Charles Nicol Klogstad, who has gone from being a reserve grader at Canberra to one of the best fullbacks in the league, or Dylan Edwards, is the world champion of this. Yep. Just run around the football a lot and shit happens. Yep. I think this is something that Salas don't have. And I, this is kind of, I wanted to move on to a slight, a tactical discussion of where Latrell Mitchell sits in this because that has never been Latrell's game. No. And actually, from the other side of the ledger, like as a Manly supporter, I would lament Tom Tabojevic for doing this, with which he, I think you waste your time putting in effort areas, effort areas and effort areas. And I think go and be a Ferrari. Like you don't have to take yeah. 25 pit ups a game, mate. That's not what your best use for this team is, but he's kind of, he's almost gone the other way on it. Whereas Latrell, I think a lot of the time, and the the effort part of it is because when he does it, it looks, when it, when it comes off, it looks really easy, which makes people think he isn't trying what he is, when he is. But there is a lot of it that like, God, if you just stood around the football more, you'd get the football more. You know, everyone always talks about, do we need to move him to get his hands on the football more? And I think, could he move himself to do that? And is that something that he could be told to do? Like, you can go and be James Tedesco's level of contribution to a game. 
just by moving yourself around more? Is that something? I see a head shake. Does that is that something that would improve his game, or would that kind of make him much well, less effective? I mean, we can speculate on it, but like it, it just hasn't happened. And I think the easiest answer for me is that he's just not that type of player. Um, you know, he's never going to do the things that James Tedesco and Dylan Edwards does, just like Dylan Edwards and James Tedesco are never going to be able to throw the passes that Latrell can, can pass. Like, just a different dude. I think in previous years, Cody Walker's probably been that support guy. Like, I was going back through my notes of the first 12 rounds of last year um, in, you know, in preparation for this. And my, so many times my notes popped up, Cody Walker, right place, right time. Like he's, when we think of Cody at his best, he's just appearing in these random spots, scoring tries that you go, where the frig has a 5'8 come from in this example? Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, whether he's not doing that or whether the opportunities are just not coming this year, uh, it certainly hasn't been as big a part of his game over the first six weeks. But, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm happy to, to stop wishing and waiting for Latrell to be a different dude other than what he is uh, as a fullback right now. Mm. If you could fill time here, Matt, I actually have the spreadsheet up in front of me and I want to talk. But the, the supports issue is something that seems, um, yeah, it seems like it is a problem that specifically South Sydney have in terms of every other team prioritizes this and South's really It's dumb. It's bad when you can just be watching the game at the pub and notice this. Like, this yeah. is the kind of stuff that you're meant to not... This is the kind of stuff that on, like, Tuesday, you're meant to message me and be like, oh, did you know that South's had the lowest number of support runs in, in the space of the last 18 months. Uh, that's the kind of stat that you're not meant to be able to just see with your eyes as you're watching the game. But the both the line speed and the support play, so, you know, the effort areas on both sides of the wall were abundantly clear. I watched the game with my 83-year-old grandfather, and he commented on how bad the line speed was. <laughs> so, like, if, if it's abundantly clear to, to an 83-year-old man who's watching with no sound at the pub, then that's a gigantic concern. And it's abundantly clear to opposition coaches yeah. as well. Like, you, t Mike, you mentioned Wade Egan tearing us up last weekend. The lead up to three of those line breaks, he's looking for Kepi or he's looking for Burgess. Like, mm. these guys are being identified as weaknesses in, around our arc and teams are figuring out ways to expose them. Have yeah, you got the numbers for the supports there, Mike? Because I've yes, I do. Com, we're, we're middling, but what what have you got? Well, let's see, uh, NRL.com... NRL me have They're the different. same source, but they 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 do it based on just how many there are. Okay, counting. I don't count. We do uh, based on opportunity. So, as in, how many do they have per run? They yeah. are twenty, the twenty fifth percent now, which means that they're in the bottom four, which is bad. I mean, it's not all everything. The Warriors are actually last, but they. I think that's. Who's first? The Roosters are first, as I got told off by Trent Robinson last year. The Panthers are 80th percentile. Da, 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 da. Uh, the Raiders very high. This is all based on how much how much ball they have, right? So teams like Cronulla, who are incredible at this, like just constantly people moving around the football all the time, which is kind of yeah why a lot of their forwards don't need you know they don't have that many big forwards because they want them to run around all the time and Souths just aren't able to do that. And it's kind of, I wish I had the stats that could split this into two to be like, how much of it is deception in attack, as in guys running different lines to make it so it doesn't look like Tom Burgess trundling the ball in on his own from 10 yards out? Because that's one thing that they, I think Souths, you can shut down the start of their sets because they're just going to trundle in and they don't actually care that much about making meters because they're trying to hit a point horizontally on the field rather than vertically so that they can go early to the left or whatever. And then there's the other stuff, which is how often is somebody, when the offload, for example, is available, is there someone to offload it to? Yeah. Because I think that's a lot of South's problem is that, yeah, they're, they're the, the lowest offloaders in the league. And I wonder how much of that is JD saying don't offload it, which mm -hmm. doesn't seem coherent with the rest of his football, and how much is there's no one to pass it to because nobody's up around the ball. Mm -hmm. That seems to me like something that, for example, Parramatta are the opposite. They'll always have somebody. They play a very similar style through the middle, but have someone to pass to where South don't. And I guess the question inherent in this is, would that change if somebody else came in? Would there then be, you know, every coach comes in and says, this team isn't fit, this team isn't trying, blah, blah, blah. Can we change that overnight? Is that something that we would expect to change, Matt? Or would that just be a, you know, with, this is just who the, as you say with the trial, this is just who he is. Like that's the, you've got to find a way to get your best players to fire. And that's not, that's not his style of game. No, it's not. And I've always, 
I've always kind of defended that, especially with, with the Latrell thing that you touched on, because like I don't think he would be as effective if he was touching the ball as many times as James Sinesco touches the ball. Mm-hmm. But yes, in, in terms of in terms of support play as well, I, I just I, I don't really know. I, they used to be really good at this stuff. Like you go back to the first half of last year again. Like you talked about Cody Walker, Oscar. Like why is he there when they when they score that winning try through Tass after Alex Johnson makes that break? Why is Cody Walker there? And then not only is there, he throws one of the best sort of sleight of hand quick passes you'll ever see to Isaiah Tass to to send him away and win the game. It's like we're just not seeing any sort of moments of magic like that from him or from anyone else this year. It just honestly feels like so much of this is mental. And that this the mood around the camp is just so bad at the moment that no one can no no one's even fathoming you know running plays like that because there's just the mood is so toxic and so I just honestly have no idea how this how they get out of this hole in general I really I really don't. Well, I can tell you what the easy answer will be. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I was just going to let the silence answer that that statement. <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm inherently, I think, a pro Jason Dimitri person because he played for Oxford Hornets when I was a ball boy at the age of 11, and therefore I love him. But, like, this is how you get into my good books, is play for Oxford Hornets. Um, but it doesn't seem to me, like, if I'm him, there's a lot of stuff that I'm thinking that is either circumstantial, things like the injuries, the lack of yardage which comes from the injuries, the fact that he can't catch the ball for these guys on play one and two, in which I'm going, well, what do you want me to do about this? And if you got in, you know, John Morris, give it John Morris until the end of the year. What, whoever the rugby league equivalent of Sam Allardyce is, like, that's not really going to change. And I think there is probably a, a bit in it too that they've also just played really hard teams. And if you look at, you know, the Cowboys, I mean, this doesn't really factor in because if we take a longer lens on this, this is maybe a good place to end, right? The long, I'm a... You know, we're trying to be sort of long lens on this. And if you look at who they, what happened to them last year, you had absolutely slammed in origin. You had Luttrell out for a long time, Mm. Maury out. You know, there's games, if you think of there was a game against the Bulldogs and the Dragons, which they never, ever lose those games with anything. And the Raiders, and the Raiders won. And the Raiders, Raiders, yeah, yeah. Well, there's there's three wins and they make the finals, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, and then we're not talking like this at all. Is that is this all circumstantial or is this something that's, you know, much as I like to do three-game rolling averages of these mm. things, it wasn't a problem at the start of the year when they did have guys on the field who didn't have to deal with origin, whereas now it looks like the world's falling in. And if you were to just let it keep going, it would probably naturally improve. Is that Would that be a manic, manic hot take? Yeah, I think, and the interesting thing, you mentioned those three games you just mentioned. I'm pretty sure that in all three of them, they scored the same number of tries as the other team and and lost on goals. And in and in those three games, like, so I, I, I'll quickly pull the team list up in front of me. Like, I think the Bulldogs one was the worst. I think the Haas were Ilias and Hawkins that day with Tarp at fullback and Havili at hooker. They had nobody. And they almost won that game. And then I think that, yeah, I think that the, the yeah, it was Hawkins and Ilias with Tarp, but Cook played hooker in the Dragons one. And then... Yeah, that Raiders one as well with with Tarf. Cody played, but again, no no Trell, no Cam Murray, yeah. and yeah, you're right. That's that's three wins right there that would have got them into the finals. But that again, would that have not just been on the back of how red hot they were in the first half of the season? Because I basically coped through that entire Origin period, saying every week on on Boom Rookies that like once South get all these guys back. Yep. Everything's just going to go back to what it was in the first 10 weeks of the season and everything's going to be fine. And I don't and I'm sure you guys remember this, but after that Bulldogs game they had a bye, right? And then they got everybody back for that Brisbane game except for Latrell. If you go back and find the ins and outs list for that for that teamless Tuesday, it's the funniest thing ever because there's honestly like 11 Rabbitohs on it. And yep. I think six Broncos as well actually. And I said this is it, they're going to go on this run now and everything's going to be okay. And what happened? They got pumped in that game. They got absolutely dog-walked by the Broncos. And yes, they came back and beat the Tigers at Scully yeah. Park next weekend. But then they go to Perth and play the Sharks. They never lose to the Sharks. And they got embarrassed. And then, as you mentioned, yeah, they win that Dragons game where, as you said, one of the worst rugby league games of all time. And then they go up to Newcastle and get embarrassed. They have another bye. Everyone's fit. No excuses. But there's no Latrobe because he got suspended against the Knights doing something stupid in the last 10 seconds of a game that they'd already lost. And then they play their arch rivals with a spot in the finals on the line and again, get absolutely embarrassed. So whilst those origin games would have got them into the finals, it's my concern is how bad they were 
in the last seven or eight weeks of the season after that Bulldogs game and after that bye when they got basically back to full strength and didn't really look like the team they were in the first half of the year. You just said, so I, you've just reminded me there. This isn't on the running order, so I'm just throwing this out. Um, mm. I'm going to throw it to Oscar because I feel like you've, you might have noticed this as well. In that Broncos game, there was a very interesting thing that the Broncos did. The Broncos are obviously good and smart, is that they, when they came up as a defensive line, when Souths put on the left shift, they didn't go the full way up, they stopped. And so Souths, I, I think Johnson might have got three line breaks last, that, that night, one of which he scored because Cody, uh, Tony Staggs missed the tackle, a one-on-one dead missed tackle. But the other ones, they just held back. They gave him a line break on the stats, but they didn't actually break the line. They did the bend, not break kind of thing. Mm. And I've seen that a lot since, that every other team has gone, hang on, if we just don't fire up, if we fire up in the line, they'll pass it around us. Yep. So we're just not going to fire up. And that looks, that would be, when I'm when I'm thinking have teams figured Souths out, that is one of the main learnings, I think, that if I was doing the opposition analysis, that's what I'd look at. I'd just go, every time they do that left shift, they want you to buy it, don't buy it. Is that too okay. simplistic? No, not. A, I'll go back and have a look at it literally after this. That's the kind of nerdy shit that will keep me occupied for the next <laughs> few hours today. But, um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense in theory. Get up and then paddle back. Um, I think Melbourne did that to contain Tom Travojevic when he had that season in 21. They'd just get up and then slide and hurt him towards the sidelines. They concede an extra 15 metres, but they knew that they weren't going to cough up a tackle break or a line break. So, yeah, I can see it working in theory. I also remember Adam Reynolds putting on a bit of a masterclass in that game and just jamming on Cody a few times as well because he recognised uh, that Cam Murray ball out the back. Um, it's it's hard no, to point out. Just, just favourite moments of last year and it never happened. It never worked out in the end, but Daily Cherry Evans, my spiritual king, picking an intercept in the 13-12 game that Lockie Lewis kicked the field goal yeah. in the same way that Reynolds did it where he just watched him go... I've seen this movie 400 times before, and I'm just yeah. that bit between Walker and Latrell, or maybe it was Murray and Latrell. Yes. I just yeah. stand in the middle and catch yeah. this and run the rest of the way. <laughs> and look, when you are very predictable, the good players will learn it, right? And and maybe that's an example of where, you know, JD looked at introducing some new shapes on that left edge this year. Like we've had uh, a decoy back rower at left four for the last. Like, can you remember the last time we've had a strike? left edge back rower at South Sydney. No, because all we need him to do is run a good decoy line. And then Isaiah Tass, not a dynamic tackle breaking creative dude, but he's got good spatial awareness and he can catch and pass. So the, um, maybe the idea was, yeah, let's introduce some different shapes like that double lead option we've seen already from them, um, from Keon and Jack uh, a few times. Is that an indication that, Maybe JD recognised we were getting a little predictable and we did want to make some changes this year, which mm. I would say is good coaching. And then three weeks later when we're 0-3, suddenly you throw it out and go back to what we were doing last year. It's It just, to me, it feels like, yeah, the confidence is obviously way down and out um, across the board there at the moment. Yeah, completely agree. Matt, so the pit of despair, what is, yeah. I, I guess... This is a good place to end, right? So we won't know. By the time this comes out, people will know whether Jason Dimitri has been sacked or not. I and mean, we have got the rugby league equivalent of the dreaded international break, which is the South <laughs> had to buy after the game with Cronulla of the weekend. Is this the sort of thing that is salvageable? Because if it is an effort areas thing, like it's certainly possible to just say, do you know what, let's just, just try harder and don't drop just the ball. Try harder. But is that the sort of thing that we can expect to happen or is it? Is it terminal in the and i want you to answer this i want you to throw out any analysis you have and answer it only from your heart as your um yeah you know, in one hand just <laughs> have, you, of you. have you seen who souths have the two weeks after the bye by the way oh yeah it's panthers. a it's a, tri- it, it's a trip to melbourne and then the panthers yep. <laughs> new manager bounce anybody oh goodness um i i don't think they're gonna sack him before the bye uh, maybe Jai Gray will be the greatest fullback of all time and they'll win this week. Who knows? But um, I, I think that the, the 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 worst thing I can say about a South team, and Oscar will know what I'm talking about, is even when they were when they were bad in the early 2000s, right, you didn't expect much because they were bad. Yeah. And that were a poorly run club with no rep players. And it was just like, you know, if they win a game, it's a bonus. Who cares? 
And then the the era of professionalism was ushered in by Russell Crowe and Peter Holmes, of course. And they had a couple of so middling years with 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 Jason Taylor and Johnny Lang there, and then Michael McGuire comes in, yeah. and they're really good, and they've got all these superstar players. If you were doing like your top twenty NRL players, South had four or five of them, right? They were a red hot team when they won the grand final. They deserved to win a comp in that time period. But I think a lot about twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen, when with basically the same roster. It was just very clear that the the, the 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 players had had sort of reached their breaking point with Maguire's style of coaching, yep. and it was a lot like it is right now, where you go, this team looks a lot like the team that was in a grand final two years ago. Why are they playing so badly? Mm-hmm. And it never got better. It was bad for basically the back end of twenty fifteen, just like last year, and then it didn't improve in twenty sixteen or seventeen, and then that's when Anthony Seabold came in and what happened with basically the same group of players, they immediately made the top four again and then stayed on that trajectory with Wayne for the next four years after that. So is this a similar situation? I'm not 100% sure, but in terms of my own gut feel, it's it, it feels it feels very similar to those last two years of the Maguire era where the, the playing group were just done with the coach. So Austin, great. You, can get, you, you can get the second part of that question, with, which is, Jason Dimitri is a very ideological coach. Souths, I think, have got a, a team who the, the roster is built to play a certain way. If yep. you were to get, for example, Wayne Bennett or Craig Bellamy, who are, I don't think are ideological coaches in the same way, would you want someone to be like? I'll, I'll give you the example as a Mali supporter that when we got rid of Des Hasler, who plays meh football. And we replaced him with Anthony Seabold, who plays a very specific, quite exciting, might not win that many games, but quite exciting style of football. You can definitely see there is a plan, right? Yeah. Would would you want someone in to be like, this team is right, is relatively old, they need to win now, or it's going to be a big rebuild, get in Wayne? Or do you go, we need to actually just redo this whole thing? Foregoing the fact that you'll get, you know, Walker's probably going to go, yep. Cook's going to go, blah, blah, blah. Is this is this what you want? Do you want your team to mean something, or do you want it to just win? This is my question. <laughs> Thanks for saving the the easy ones to last. The easy one. ones for the end, yeah. Um, look, I th- uh, there's definitely merit to the argument that um, you know there might need to be some changes in this roster. Um, I think, like, I'll use Damian Cook as a nice example, right? The six again era, everyone goes, "Oh shit, yeah, Damian Cook's fast, and the ruck speed's going to be quicker." So Damian Cook's going to be the best dummy half in the game. Fast forward three years, the three best dummy halves in the game are not fast. They're creative ball players. Appy, Harry Grant, and Wade Egan at the moment are tearing teams apart because defensive lines are compressing because of the six again era. Um, and therefore, there's less room for runners, right? So you look at a guy like Cookie, maybe is he not as suited to today's game? Maybe is he three years older than he was when he was running rampant three years ago? Same for Cody. Um, you know. I think the game plan that we were playing with last year with a very, you know, up and down halfback who can get to good points on the field and then give the ball to our creative guys, I'm cool with that as a game plan, but the defensive grit and the resilience needs to be there. And at the moment, that's our biggest problem. We can't absorb pressure uh, and we're very unresilient. And one error leads to another penalty, leads to another penalty, and suddenly we're down 16-0. So, yeah, I think it's time for a change. I th- I said to Jace the other day, the over-under lines at six and a half days for, for JD at Redfern. I think the buy will keep him there for a little longer. But, yeah, I think, unfortunately, uh, it's time for a change at the Bunnies. I don't know if Wayne coming in, I mean, it fixes it in the short term, right? Um, Matt, I mean, I don't know what Matt thinks as another South fan having the old man back. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting watch. Yeah, I... I, I... I don't know what's going to happen, but you know, they were fantastic under Wayne Bennett for three and a half seasons. So um, yeah, (laughs) Bellamy would be an absolute fever dream, but again, that's not going to happen. If you were going to go the other route, maybe someone like Matt King or even getting John Morris back potentially might be something that they explore. John Morris was an assistant last year and he also was the defensive coach up until halfway through last year when he left along with Sam Burgess midway through the season, which kind of culminated with their defense becoming terrible. Yeah. So maybe there's something to that as well. Do we know how much Sam had to do with the defensive systems when he was in a coaching capacity there? Um, I don't think he had too much to do with it, but I think that a lot of the things that he said yeah. are 
kind of been proven correct so far through the first few weeks of this season, which is very concerning. We have got 59 minutes and 55 seconds without mentioning who runs South Sydney. So mm. that, is, that is a good effort. And I would say I, I'm a John Morris fan. I think John Morris was very unfairly treated at Cronulla and I think would be yeah. very good if he was the coach of South Sydney. But we'll leave it at that because we don't know. Thanks so much. This has been super illuminating. Um, Firstly, I'll say, if you like this podcast, please recommend it to your friends. Please share it, like it, leave us reviews. We all like that sort of stuff. Also, listen to NRL Boom Rookies with Matt Bungard and Nick Hampton and other people. Um, mm. If you want to hear depressive insights on South Sydney more frequently than, than every so often. <laughs> we talk about other teams as well. The other, it's all the other, the other parts are very, very high energy, very lighthearted. Very up. I, I hear you're all Manly fans now, anyway. So, I, I, is this what I'm team, team of the team show, mate? Team of the show. <laughs> what, um, what a year! Best team in the league to watch. Um, mm. And they play down the road for me. And Oscar Panifex does always brilliant stuff in rugby league writers, as does Jason Oliver. You mentioned there in the, the briefly made me think you were talking about your personal conversations with Jason Dimitri. Was <laughs> <Oliver. laughs> Uh, Never seen you at meet one of his media ups. You just got straight on the phone and ring him up, eh? Yeah, called him up. No, no, not quite. Yeah, no, thank you for having me, mate. That was a good chat. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for listening. And uh, glory, glory to South Sydney. Is that how you say it? <laughs> sure. I'm on the up the, I'm on the up the wires bandwagon, I think. My lads oh, are oh, he's jumping ship. <laughs> oh no. Who could blame him? <laughs>